So this talk is why you should join a community. And I've never used this on Keynote before, but it's really cool because I can do it from my phone. So my name is Amy Marish, for those of you who don't know me. I am technically a principal technical marketing manager at Red Hat, specializing in OpenStack. Um, my self-proclaimed title, and I was allowed to do it by my boss, is I'm an open source evangelist. Because I work more upstream than I do downstream. I do work with PM and PMM, but anyone who knows me knows I'm upstream all the time. So these are the ways you can reach me. I am IRC on S spots. I'm also in the matrix. And that's spots with a Z because we also have spot in the community. We're two totally different people with different heights. And I don't have blue hair. So the agenda, roles in communities, a walk through history, which I think y'all will enjoy, giving back in communities, and time for a Q&A. So we can have plenty of discussion, and I talk kind of fast, so we will have plenty of time. So first off is the roles in communities. And there's roles that are in every community. The first is developers, which I think everyone can guess on that. So a primary role of the developers are coding and bug fixes. They may be bug fixes that they did, bug fixes that were reported that someone else did, and then reviewing and testing code. And this is really important. A lot of people don't test their own code before they get it merged. Um, a lot of the gating systems are not as controlling as maybe they should be. So as long as everyone's happy, they hit a button and it gets merged. Um, I work a lot with Zool, so what Zool does when we put a patch in for OpenStack is it tests it against that project, and it can give it a verified plus one. But then after it gets enough reviews from the cores and the community, it goes back through the gates and actually gets tested against the whole entire project. We call that workflow, and it gets a plus two from the system, and then it can get merged. But someone's got to write those tests, otherwise you can still get merged, but it's not being tested against anything. Collaboration and community engagement. Developers need to get out there and talk to the community. Um, collaboration, one project works with another project. Smaller um, open source communities, they may just be there working on one thing. But Fedora, CentOS, OpenStack, Kubernetes, there's lots of different projects and they all have to get work together in order for a change to happen. And it could just be, we're making a networking change, this is what's gonna happen, are you gonna be okay with that? I'm really enjoying this phone thing. And documentation and tutorials. Even if there is a document team, it really helps if the developer documents what they did and what it should do at the very least. Because otherwise, no one knows what it did. They have to go through the code, and you're starting from scratch. And tutorials, especially if it has an operational point of you configure it like this, and this is why it does it. And then operators and users. I, can, I personally consider them part of the community. It's where I started as an operator. So they utilize and they test the software. They're the ones who are actually going to use it. And they report issues and provide feedback. I found a bug. This is what happened. This is the way to replicate it. But providing feedback can also be, that is the greatest UI I have ever used. I love where you place that button. Part participating in discussion. How do you know what they need if they don't participate in the discussions? You may think they need feature X and B, and you're spending 20 hours a week on feature X? Nobody needs feature X. They would like feature Y. And when they explain it to you, you realize why they want feature Y. And then again, creating documentation and tutorials, because their use case may be different than what the developer thought of. So they're gonna write something a little different about why you should use it. And if you connect this piece with this piece and you do this configuration, 
you can make all these great things happen. And leadership, whether it's something separate or not, they f facilitate the collaboration. Let's have a discussion. Even if it's in IRC, we're ha having our weekly meeting. Let me start the meat bot. These are our topics. Setting and com communicating vision. I can't even read my own stuff. Um, so this could be, this is the goal of our project. This is why we're doing it. This is why you should use our project. Nurturing community growth. If your leaders aren't positive, inclusive, understanding, have empathy for the users and the developers, you're not gonna grow. You're just gonna have a two-person project. And coordination and organization. And I kind of mentioned that when I discussed meetings and having topics and an agenda and the meat bot and stuff. But it could also be for instance, totally different, but Sean, working with Justin, to have this event. You know, how can we get our communities to work together? And conflict resolution and mediation. Let's be real, there's a lot of conflict. Um, when open source started, there wasn't a need for code of conducts. Now there is, and your leadership are the ones who are gonna get it reported need to discuss it and correct the problems. And it may even be that, hey, we realize we just did this in OpenStack. We realized that our code of conduct was outdated. So we all got together, we worked on it, and we got a new code of conduct past the board and legal because we felt that things were missing from it. So even if you have your governance in place, it may need updating. And guiding the technical direction. In some projects, and Fordora is a good example, there is a steering committee in place. Their job is to decide where things should go technically. They may not be the overall leaders of the project, but they are the ones who give the vision and make the decisions for the technical aspects of it. Um, OpenStack is another one. We have a technical committee. Um, the board of directors do not make any technical decisions, and we'll tell you, go talk to the TC. So as I mentioned, some roles are in every community. So once you get out of those small, teeny, tiny, two-person committees, communities, you get more people in. And there's more roles. And it's not necessarily the same people doing everything. Even though, even in a larger community, that documentation should still be done by the developers and the users. But for technical writers, you actually have someone who can help you fix your documentation. So they document project features and functionality, and they're gonna clean up what should hopefully already exist from the developers and make it more usable. Managing and maintaining project documentation. So this may not be necessarily the documentation on how to contribute or to use it, but the overall documentation for the project. This is our mission. This is what we wanna do. Creating developer resources. So again, they take the basics that they say they need and then help to improve them and make them better and they might come up with totally different things. And supporting community engagement. Again, you're, there's gonna be a theme here of supporting the community. Um, so this could be that they redid the onboarding documentation so that it's Good, a technical writers could be involved in the social media. Infrastructure. So now that you're no longer just doing your thing with your merge requests on GitHub, you might actually have infrastructure behind it. So system administration and maintenance. You're running your own gates. You have to create users on those systems for the developers to do stuff. Development and configuration management. So again, they're gonna to wanna to make their life easier. So they're gonna to wanna to use Ansible. What else do we use in these days? Um, back in the day, we used Chef, uh, Puppet. Puppet's still pretty popular. But mainly, they're gonna use either Ansible or, hey, it's in OpenStack. <laughs> we can't get rid of it. 
because we have a lot of stuff in our works and we don't have anyone to contribute. Again, infrastructure. Um, continuous CI and CD. Um, for us in Open Infra, we use Zool, which is actually another project under Open Infra. And that's the one where I was telling that it'll test your code, your initial code to make sure it passes your project and then that it'll work on the whole entire project. So um, I know GitHub will do some tests for you if you write it, but to be honest with you, I don't know of another system. I think Hopper is doing something similar where you can test against your whole project. Scalability and performance op optimization. Our gates are timing. Why are our gates timing? Well, this provider only gave us five systems this week, nodes this week to test against. We're going to have to add some more nodes onto another system so that we have the capacity we need in order to do our testing. So the largest communities, graphic artists. Thank you, Mo. <laughs> Sometimes you also just need friends who can help you with your graphic artist problems. Um, so some of the things they do, the logos and the branding materials. Creating user interface and user experience because they have a visual eye. You might think that button goes down there and then they take a look at it and go, oh no, you don't want it down there. You want to put it here and put it on the left, not the right, because everyone's used to it being on the left. Have you ever clicked on the wrong button? When a pop-up comes up because you're so used to it being in one place, user experience. Designing promotional materials. It can be something as simple as the stickers we've all been handing out outside. It can be something more detailed, um, one pagers that you put on the counter at FOSDEM for people to pick up so they know what you're doing. And provide, providing visual assets for documentation that could be graphics or even this lovely Fedora presentation template. I didn't make it. Translators were global. Larger projects often have translation teams. So they translate the documentation, they localize the user interface, translating project communication, I don't know if I have it on there, reviewing, reviewing and editing translations. Um, part of localizing and not even the user interface, and I, I guess I don't have it separate, is what pops up as warnings. That's one of my first OpenStack contributions. I actually have Python code in OpenStack, putting in localization tags so that, all the, so that if you come up with a warning, it is in your language, and the explanation of that warning is in your language. Something you might not think about, but is very important for a global community. Community advocates. I've been saying every, it's kind of everybody's role, but there are often people who just advocate for their communities. So communi community engagement and support, these might be the people who are on your help. You know, you've got a help forum and they're the ones who are gonna answer because they're always there and they're always trying to be helpful. Also a great way to get involved in a community. Outreach and promotion, your ambassadors. They're going to reach out and say, hey, you've got a meetup coming up. Would you like us to speak at it? Or they're just a point of contact that someone can say, we're having a meetup. I'm looking for someone who can come talk and we'll go, oh, here's all the ambassadors in your area. Community building. Hold an event. Um, attend a conference. Have a social. Feedback collection and communication. Um, user surveys are great for your communities um, because that's where you get your feedback a lot of the times from your users and your participants. Um, or it can also be someone just attending an event. Oh, I see you're wearing a so-and-so t-shirt. Oh yeah, I, I do so-and-so on the committee. Well, I really, really like what you're doing. I like this aspect, I like that aspect. It's like, I'm gonna write down, I'm gonna take it back to the team. And providing diversity and inclusion, promoting diversity and inclusion. A lot of times the advocates are the ones who are gonna go out, you know, they see someone who's struggling in the community and they wanna be the one who is inclusive. It's just how we are, that um, we were kind of joking at the table earlier today. I might have a reservation for 10 people at a restaurant. I'm, we're walking to the 
the restaurant, I see someone kind of just walking by themselves in a strange town because they're at the conference and they don't know anybody. It's their first time. Like, hey, you want to come eat with us? You know, it's, it's just that simple of getting someone involved in a community is just seeing that they're alone, they're confused, and inviting them along. Okay, this is kind of fun for me. In the beginning, if you build it, they will come. Come on, look. So we, we, we're talking about diversity and inclusion today. And um, when open source kind of started, it was all the same people. In this case, I got my three cavemen. And they will come. Well, our operators were kind of the same people too. But then there were communities. So it wasn't just two people in a room on the internet with GitHub. We started putting people together. So it wasn't just for developers anymore. And we have different people. So we have a developer, a tech writer, maybe a user. Um, so we started to look different. We weren't just those two guys in a room who like, have been best friends for five years or all their entire life. And this is important. Now, if you also notice, we still don't have cultural diversity here. But at least now we've got some gender diversity going on. And where we are today, communities are for everyone. And I tried to get as diverse as I could on the people. I think that's all our people. So you still have, you know, everyone's working together. And this is actually, I really like this one also because they're all behind a computer. So they are out there working from their houses. They are out there working from the offices. Some of these may be employed. Some of them may be volunteering. I volunteer in a whole lot more communities than I'm actually paid to participate in. Um, but there's people of interest, and they all bring something different to that community. Actually, I'm not going near as fast as I thought I was. So ways of giving back to communities. Hey, I, I can talk really fast. Performing reviews. Everyone should be performing reviews. And it's a great way to get started in a community. Um, going back to OpenStack, we have the ability to plus one. Anybody can plus one anything. Anyone can minus one anything. It's only when you get to more of a leadership role, which we call your cores, where you can plus two or minus two people. Help grow the community. You love your community, you invite people to join the community. Promote diversity and inclusion. Now, anyone who was at the meeting yesterday for the panel noticed it was all white males. Um, on CentOS's behalf, that was a conscious decision I chose to make. I could have taken that chair. I felt uh, Davida was the best person to represent us in that case. Benny could have been here for Alma. She is not here in attendance. But it's important to note that those two projects have female leadership. Mentoring, because this is the mentoring summit. So you can have internal project mentoring, which is kind of what we've been talking about this morning. One or more mentoring. I kind of mentioned the cohorts this morning. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It depends on the group and how active they're willing to be. But even with one-on-one -on -one mentoring, um, sometimes you know, you're, you're paired up with someone you never hear from your mentor or you never hear from your mentee. And there's the cohort mentoring. Now, external mentoring programs. Outreachy. Outreachy is like the most popular um, project out there. I think it's one of the best run. But it's also nice that they get paid. They get paid to be there as a mentee, and that gives them the ability to maybe not get that job at the fast food restaurant and while they're in college and working on things. Google Summer of Code and Docs. I don't know if Docs is still going on. It ran for like a year or two, and then I haven't really seen it. Um, but that was a Google-sponsored internship. And again, open source projects. You didn't have to be a Google project for it. And questions and answers. Yes. Oh, and I did attribute on the slide where the artwork came from. The caveman came from the clip art from up over here. And the other clip art that I really liked was Philip Martin's that intro. And it's just clip art. There's nothing special about it. It's like the books. 
So I just wanted to point something out. Google Summer of Code is very code centric. They will not accept UX. I guess they have a special program for docs. Um, but outreachy, well, you can do community advocacy, you can do UX, all the roles that you went through are eligible for outreachy. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I'm Shaza, I'm a student at UCC, University College Cork, um, and my question would be, like, I'm not sure if this mentioned throughout the last two days or not, um, but would there be any direct connection between Fedora and universities, either in America or in India or in Europe, Middle East, any of this? I can answer. Sweet. <laughs> I can answer. Um, so in Brno, Red Hat has a long-term relationship with the uh, um, Brno University of Technology, um, where a lot of interns come as students, um, and many of them work uh, not on the um, internal Red Hat stuff. They do work on uh, up upstream projects, uh, contribute to the projects, or contribute these projects to Fedora. So it's kind of covering there. So at least in Brno, and I think it's also Boston University yeah. that's been involved uh, in the same or similar program. Yeah, that's, that's how we uh, already have in place for um, Fedora contributions. And but not these programs, these programs, they unfortunately tie it to specific universities. And that's usually how it's run around the world because um, it's collaboration with specific faculties or professors um, in the um, particular areas. Now, Outreachy is not tied to any particular college. I do not think the Google Summer of Projects are tied necessarily even to, you have to be a university student. Um, Open Infra is tied to a few different universities in the United States, but we are open to other um, colleges who want to contact the Open Infra Foundation to do, they're gonna be more open staff, kata containers, you know, our projects versus Fedora. But I think if you contacted foundations or maybe Linux Foundation as well, so at more of, more of a foundational level or board level, type of, you know, hey, I'm from this university, this is my professor, we're kind of interested. You know, you might be able to make it more, a more informal formal, so it may not be paid. But they might be able to work with the university in order to have an internship project. Um, yeah, I'm actually an intern at Red Hat, and I could say that this is, you know, the relations between universities and companies does exist you know, during these, uh, providing these internships and things. Um, but I would say, like, from the university I'm in right now, considered one of the largest universities in Ireland, and it was unfortunate that I didn't know anything about open source projects before I start my internship in Red Hat. And I can see how amazing it is, you know, throughout my internship and throughout this event. But, you know, the idea that we, we're not, you know, open to any of this in the university, either from the academic perspective or from the event per perspective. Um, so like my curious more is like, would there be any in the future, you, you know, more like Fedora events that holds in universities to introduce students to these projects and, you know, contribution to open source that these students who's looking for experiences can contribute to this because me as a student, I'm looking for experience and I always try to fill my time in the summertime you know, Christmas time to do, you know, any, any um, some sort of things that I can fill my time with that will benefit me on my CV and experience. So I think lots of students would be interested, not just technical courses, but also non-technical courses, would be interested in contribution to Fedora. So if, yeah, if this can be made in the future, it would be amazing. I'm a little worried that in your coursework you never heard of open source. <laughs> um, and I was going to point to you anyways, Mike. Um, so there are de developer advocates that work at the foundation, Open Info Foundation, that I know reaches out, and I will talk with her after this event when I get back on U.S. soil. Good, Mike. 
Yeah, um, maybe just in response. So uh, I work for the Rochester Institute of Technology, <laughs> so university. Um, uh, we're very lucky to have a long history of open source. So we have an academic minor in open source where students can take a, a series of five undergraduate courses um, and they're multidisciplinary too, so it's not just focused on development, but uh, you, know, you can be a business student talking about open source businesses and stuff like that. Um, you know, graciously, a lot of our history actually stems with our original partnership with Red Hat that, uh, you know, for many, many years uh, donated funding to our university and allowed us to have this very rich and vibrant student group that, you know, I was a part of when I was young. Justin Flory uh, was a part of and, you know, I think was, was a great way of us interacting uh, with uh, open source projects. So with regards to your question, um, I've noticed being in working in academia for the last three years, there is a large disparity uh, between universities where um, some have, you know, for probably mostly through like just chance and luck, have been able to get funding and resources uh, to build these programs and they've been really successful and students have loved them. Uh, and then others uh, simply haven't had the resources, wherewithal, or, you know, it, there hasn't been this, like, academic shift towards open source just yet. Um, in Ireland, if you're interested in the Irish ecosystem, uh, certainly uh, Trinity College Dublin has um, a technology transfer office that's very open source forward. So if you're interested, I could introduce you to the people over there. Uh, we've worked with them, and they're uh, excellent. And there, there has been a couple other universities I'll have to dig through my contact list, but I'd be happy to connect you with people. If you at least want like the Irish uh, connection, I'd be happy. And maybe through that, there could be a, a larger sort of um, Yeah, because I can think of the University of Omaha, Nebraska, which runs the Chaos Project out of there. That's where it started. So there are universities that are doing things. Um, I'm a little disappointed to hear that it wasn't part of yours. Okay, and let me clarify that I was an animal science major. I was pre-vet. So I did not take computer science classes. So what your degree in also doesn't determine what you can do and develop in open source. You know, so most of the developers, yes, they come out of computer science programs, but there's so many different things you can major in and become involved in open source. Mo? Yeah. So I had a question on another topic. Um, you mentioned in this talk and earlier this morning about mentor cohorts. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a concept I'm not quite familiar with, so I was hoping you could talk about it. So because open, believe it or not, OpenStack and Kubernetes communities were very close. We talked to each other all the time. Um, and one thing these started was like one mentor with three to five mentees. Um, and it seemed to work really well for them when they were in their hype of development. Um, just for clarity, OpenStack is no longer in a type. We actually have more cores out there than we've ever had before. We're growing like crazy from users, but we don't have the hype. Um, Kubernetes still has the hype, though they have a lot of the same issues that we do, so it's always interesting to talk with them. But the idea being that if you could put one or two mentors with a cohort, there was less pull on the mentor itself. So, you know, if they had a meeting or went on PTO, your mentees weren't just sitting there twiddling their thumbs. So there are those advantages. Um, but one thing I felt that we had the issue with where, remember I mentioned that they wouldn't even introduce themselves. So they might be too shy, and we didn't get to imposter syndrome earlier today, but imposter syndrome can actually prevent you from just replying to the email with, hi, my name is Amy, and I came from the University of Florida, and I'm just getting started, and I'm interested in X, Y, and Z. You wouldn't think imposter syndrome can keep you from doing that little bit, but it can. So you don't have that necessarily that one-on-one -on -one relationship on a, as a one-on-one -on -one mentoring. You have to be a little more out there. So there are definitely advantages and disadvantages of it. Um, so it really depends on your community and the mentors and mentees you have. You have to figure out what works for yourself. Now, 
You mentioned that it was something that was done in these communities when they're in their hype. Like now that the hype is maybe died off a little bit, is this a less effective technique? Like is, what are the requirements that would make this a successful approach? I wouldn't say it's a less successful technique, but they had more people coming in. So they had more demand on the mentors than they had mentors. So it allowed them to share the work and help more people. So that's where the advantage is it, because you're not taxing a mentor as much because they have a buddy or two. And you can mentor three, five, ten people so you can cover more ground. It's kind of like private tutoring versus a classroom. You just balance it out. I, it, please ask a question on another topic if I'm <laughs> digging into this too much. I'm, I'm curious, would the two mentors be sort of a similar... Like if, if, I'll just throw out a random example, like if um, in OpenStack, if it was like networking, would it, both mentors be expected to be networking experts or could it be one is more general OpenStack, maybe they work on something else but they're there to support the other mentor? Like are there different models there that might work better than others? So we had um, different tracks that you could say you wanted to be mentored in and that you wanted a mentee. Um, so unless someone, said, you know, all five of us want to be Neutron, which was our networking, we wouldn't necessarily be that specific. Um, the idea also is we've run liaisons so that in each of the individual OpenStack project, we had a name of someone we could put people in touch with. So kind of like a mini mentor, you know, so that I've got my Git and Garrett set up, you know, I've done some docs, I've, you know, I've done this and I'm really interested in networking. Oh, well, why don't you talk to Alfredo? Why don't you talk to Elvira? They're on the team. They're great people. Let me put you in touch with them. Because sometimes also, you know, that community advocacy isn't necessarily that you know all the answers, but you know who to send someone to. We actually went over. I'm so proud of myself for talking slow. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>